Uh, the type of meditation which I teach here, I think see many people have been here before, so you know roughly how I speak. Uh, other people have come here maybe for the first time. And the meditation is not that difficult. We make it difficult. One of the reasons is because we have too many aspirations and goals. We want too much out of the meditation. And when we want something, that is when we cause trouble. Ajahn Chah's simile, which I say every time I come here, he would hold his hand up, not having cameras or any other visual aids. He'd hold his hand up and he'd wave it up and down like this. And he would say, this is a simile, it rep represents a leaf on a tree or on a bush. And it only moves up and down because something outside of it makes it move. The wind. If the wind stopped, then the move, the wind, so the leaf, would move less and less and less until the leaf would come to a state of absolute stillness, because that's its natural state. What we call these days its default state, to be perfectly still. It's only something outside of it makes it move. And he said that's the same for the human mind. It only moves because something outside of it is making it move. And that's what we call the winds of wanting something. When you want something, the mind starts to move. Even wanting good things makes it move. So our job in meditation, little by little, to allow the mind just to settle down, to be content, so it doesn't want anything in the whole world. Just being here and seeing what happens next. It comes to state of stillness. And but anyway, back to the lesson. Okay, very good. So when we want something, that causes disturbance. And so the opposite of wanting is letting go. Letting things be. And I said this yesterday, I'm not going to do it very much here. How do you keep the cup of water still? It's never still if you don't pay attention. You pay attention, you concentrate. It is always moving. It doesn't matter how long you try and hold this cup and make it still. It just makes it move more. So one day you learn just to let it go, put it down, relax to the max. And if you relax to the max, you will find the body becomes very comfortable and the water becomes still. It's so easy to actually to have a glass of water, a cup of water, be absolutely still. No effort at all. Easy. When you are wise, you know how to let things be. You're not wanting things, you're not trying to get rid of things, letting it be. That becomes the essence of the meditation. Now, one of the reasons is people say, oh, it's just so hard to meditate. Why? What are you trying to do? Doing stuff is what you have to uh, uh, face when you go to work. It's what you have to do when you're cleaning up your house. It's what you have to do when you're driving here. But once you are here, sitting on your chair, see if you can just let things be. Not to even do stuff, but to investigate, explore stuff. The only way to explore it is learning how to be. So when we actually... This is, oh, this is a story uh, from the Thai forest tradition. And this is a story which I always remember, it was told to me personally, and it was uh, also, also something on lights. You want lights? Turn off the projector. Okay, we will see. Da da da. Yes. 
That's better, is it? Excellent. Very good. <laughs> okay, I don't know what's good, what's better, what's worse. Because I wrote a book about good, bad, who knows? <laughs> so I just leave it alone. So anyway, that once we uh, learn how to let things be, things become quite peaceful. So the way we start this is like um, doing something which was, you know, for those of you who are out and out Buddhists who know the suttas, was on uh, body awareness, kaya gata sati, the first of even the satipatthanas, is learning how to be able to be aware of your body and know how it works, to explore it. But to be able to understand it, this was a simile which I got uh, again from Ajahn Mahabua years and years ago when I went to go visit him because part of the training of being a young monk would be to visit different teachers in different places so you can get a round view, a wide view of the different practices which were available. Ajahn Chah was very good because he teach at some areas and other areas you know, he didn't focus on too much, other people focused on other areas so the whole idea of you know, our meditative tradition is not just to depend on one teacher, one main teacher for sure, but also get other little bits of the jigsaw puzzle from other places. So when I went to visit him, this is when Ajahn Mahabhu, he told a story and he said, you know, this is for the, the Western monk who just come from Ajahn Chah, it was directed specifically at me and at that time I could understand Thai perfectly. And I remember what he said and I always remember it because not just because it was directed at me, but also because of what it was saying. This monk was known to be a very, very tough monk. But what he said was totally against his character. Because he said that many, many years previously, when he was practicing in the jungles with his teacher, a monk called Ajahn Mun, that he got malaria fever. It was just common for monks living in the forest to get things like malaria. It was just like getting the flu, just something you expected and had to deal with. So he was in the middle of a bout of fever, malaria fever. When it came the time for the monks to do their afternoon chores, which was in the forest monasteries, was mostly sweeping leaves on the path and then maybe hoarding water. So he was in the middle of a fever, but this monk had such a strong will that he got up in the middle of the fever you know, put on his robe and took the broom and went to sweep the path. And as soon as his teacher, Ajahn Man, saw this Mahabhua, so much energy, so much courage, so much willpower, Ajahn Man just scolded him and blasted him and told what a stupid monk he was. And he said, in the Buddhist tradition, we don't fight things we explore them, we use our insight, we use our investigation, our exploration to find out these things, not to conquer them, but to get to know them. And I always remember that because a monk like Ajahn Mahabur was always the fiercest of monks which I've ever seen. And even he was saying that that is not the way is to explore and investigate. So, we start with our body and we explore it. We explore it with our mindfulness, this wonderful thing called awareness, which is very popular these days and there's so many different definitions of mindfulness. And I'm a bit concerned that in a few years time I will not be able to teach mindfulness and the reason is because it is becoming a profession which is getting regulated and I haven't gone through the official training and got in my certificate to be a mindfulness teacher. You may think that's funny but <laughs> one, of, one of the old disciples, he was a clinical psychiatrist. No, that was a Sanat de Tisira when he was um, a clinical psychiatrist and he was telling me that 
they invited, I think, to Sydney University a top uh, American psychiatrist, you know, from one of the great universities in the United States, and he invited him to, to visit you know, Australia for one year on a professional visa so that he could you know, share his knowledge and experience here in Australia, in Sydney University. But the College of Psychiatrists or Psychiatry here in Australia said, well, you know, we can't just invite anybody in. You have to pass the test first of all. And what do you mean pass a test? I'm a great teacher in the university. He said, well, I don't care, but everyone has to pass this little exam to, to qualify because your qualifications in the United States are not sufficient. We have to make sure they're okay here in Australia. So they gave him two books to study on which he would be examined on. And he looked at that first book and he said, who wrote that book? Whose name is on that? That was me! I write that book. <laughs> but nevertheless, he had to be examined <laughs> on the book which he wrote. <laughs> it's a crazy world. But anyway, I'm sure that's going to happen one day. That because how oh, you have to do a test at Jampa on mindfulness because you haven't got a certificate. <laughs> but anyway, anyway, that mindfulness is very common. But one of the wonderful ways, you know, we lived that life for such a long time, but much more than just mindfulness. We learn how to feel, you know, the sensations in our body. And in order to be able to get to know them, we have to just explore them. And exploring them without trying to get rid of them or trying to judge them or trying to do anything with them. Get to know them, first of all. Even in, you know, the... It's amazing, this book, it's got so much wisdom, even though you look at the cover and it's the last thing a Buddhist monk would want to read, the, the, the Chinese art of war. But in that book, you know, sayings like, know your enemy, know yourself, a thousand battles fought, a thousand battles won. Not by power or force, but just understanding. And this is actually where we can understand our physical body Really get to understand and get to know it. Get to know your body, get to know yourself. A thousand diseases incurred, a thousand diseases cured. That's my saying, adapted. But you've got to understand your body, how it works. So, one way of getting that mindfulness, so how do we become mindful, is ask a question. Now, when you go to see the doctor, you got a flu, they say, the doctor says, well, you know, how does it feel? Oh, you know, what are the symptoms? The doctor is asking you to be mindful of your own body and for you to, to describe those feelings so the doctor has some idea of what's going on. And there was a case recently of this, this person, he went to see the doctor and the doctor asked him, he said, well, what, what are the symptoms? Everything, my whole body hurts. He said, what do you mean? He said, well, when I touch my head, it hurts. You know, when I touch my mouth, that hurts. When I touch my shoulder, it hurts. When I touch my belly, it hurts. When I touch my legs, it hurts. And the doctor said, oh, I know the problem. You've got a broken finger. <laughs> 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 you like that one, do you? Okay, you're going to get worse later on. <laughs> but the thing is, we need to describe it to ourselves more than anybody else to understand what the problem is. So, when I'm going to do the guided meditations, which I'm going to try and do as much guided meditations as instructions uh, without the meditation, you actually start by feeling the body. So, don't... Um, look at this part of your body, but just keep looking at me, or have your eyes closed. How does your left foot feel right now? How does it feel? Ask the question. And now you can find you're mindful of your left foot. Wiggle the toes. Can you do that without looking at it? Of course you can do that, because you've learned how to do that. You know when you're wiggling your toes, because you're Awareness, mindfulness gives you feedback. 
you know you wiggled your toes, you know you stopped wiggling your toes. Without looking at them, you're mindful, you're feeling them, you're aware of them. Now we use that mindfulness, asking the question, feeling, to get what we call feedback. Just the way if you have a house and you put the air con on or the heater on because it's cold in Melbourne this time of the year, you can actually check on the thermometer if it's gone really cold or whether it's too hot. The thermometer gives you feedback so you can adjust the temperature accordingly. If you are cooking a meal, sometimes that people even taste the food, oh it needs a bit more more uh, sauce or it needs a bit more chili or it needs a bit more whatever. You actually can taste it because that taste gives you feedback, you know how to adjust to get to the, the, the optimum taste in the food. The mindfulness is often used to get that feedback. So we start in the meditation which I have been developing over these years. We start with awareness of our body, starting with awareness of your legs. How are they? You just ask that question and then your mind goes to that part of your body and then you can start to experiment. Being a scientist, I like the word experiment, trial and error. Because this way you can actually move your body this way and that way, starting off with your legs to get the best position for them. You move them this way, is that better? Move them back again, is that better? It gives you the feedback which means you can get the best position for your own legs. And you take time doing that. Now this is not just for the sake of physical comfort. It gets much further than that because it's starting off a little method of awareness, feedback, adjusting, until you get a great degree of peace and comfort. It's learning how to relax. An example of this, to show how powerful it can be for solving many problems, that <laughs> there was a a uh, disciple of mine who was actually, uh, her uncle was the main disciple and she was in Adelaide doing um, dentistry, Adelaide University. And at that time she had a very severe anxiety. And the anxiety, the panic attacks got so severe and chronic that she was bedridden and she couldn't even get out of her bed to go to see a doctor because she was just too terrified. And even though the doctors and the psychologists came to see her, nothing was working. Very brilliant girl, but crippled with anxiety disorder. So, it was her uncle who told her to call me it was during the Wasa period, that's a range retreat where I couldn't go traveling. So I just did all the healing over the phone. Not any magical stuff, just basic mindfulness and kindness and learning, exploring and then seeing how these things work. So I told her when she called me from her bed, when you have an anxiety attack, where do you feel it? because every emotion has a counterpart physical manifestation. And she said, I don't know. I said, give me a call in three days when you can tell me. And I don't want just a rough location on your body where you feel it. I, no, I said, no, the first question was, where do you feel it? And three days later she called up and said, I feel it in my chest. Where in your chest? I asked. Where? Well, in my chest. And I said, I want coordinates, starting from your navel, how many centimeters and millimeters up? Is it centered to the left of your breastbone or the right of your breastbone? It, is it just a spot or is it a circle, is it an oval? I want a good description, when you have a panic attack, where that tension which you feel in your chest, where it actually is. 
So I gave her something to do. Another three days later, she called me up and she gave me something which she could do. I wasn't taking control of her illness and her, and her therapy. I was giving her help so she could do it herself. So she said, I felt it like an oval, centered so much up from my uh, navel, a little bit to the right or the left. And she described where the feeling was. And then the next thing was, okay, now what does that feeling feel like? I want to describe it for me. Well, it's just tension, it's, it's, it's tight. Not good enough, I said. I want a full description, like a teacher asked their student to do a two-page essay on the sort of state of the economy in Australia or something. I want more details. Call me in three days. And she called, <laughs> she called me in three more days. And because she was like a really good, good uh, scientist, it gave her something to do. She had all the time in the world to explore you know, the, the physical manifestation of her anxi anxiety attacks. And she gave this wonderful description of it, just how it develops, how it feels at first, and, and where it centers, how it moves across her chest, and for how long. And I said, well, marvelous. Now I can tick the box, you're mindful of that feeling. It doesn't mean to speak, oh, it's tense. I want more details, full awareness. I said, the next part of the therapy, please, you can come and find a seat in the back somewhere, or you can find a seat in the front. <laughs> There's many seats up on the on the up here, but you have to shave your hair off first of all to get up here. <laughs> These are some seats over there, one over there anyway. <coughs> so anyway, so the the next part of her therapy was also important for this practice of mindfulness. I said, I want you now to to take. I can go. Through, it's okay. Go through, it's okay. It doesn't matter. I want you now to, uh, whenever you have that panic attack, to take your hand and massage it. Massage that area of your body with as much kindness and compassion and care as you can possibly do. And she said, well, sometimes I just don't have the energy for that. But I knew that she was had a living boyfriend He's one of these boys who, if you ever find a boy and you're a young girl like that, just don't let him go because he'd wash for her, cook for her, clean for her, because she could do nothing for herself. She had anxiety bedridden. So I said, if you don't have the energy to do that, ask your boyfriend to do that. I don't think he would mind. <laughs> <laughs> and give me a call in three days. So she gave a call in three days. This was the last part of the story. Oh, not the last part, but the nice part of the story. That was where she called and I said, well, you did you do that? I said, yeah, I could feel the, the anxiety, the, the tension there, and, and I massaged it. And I said, what happened to the tightness in your chest? And he said, it, it vanished, it disappeared. She had the feedback that the tightness actually vanished. When you massage the tightness, after a while it just disappears. And then I asked her, what happened to the anxiety? And that was one of those moments where she paused. We call it the eureka moment, the light bulb moment. She said, the anxiety disappeared as well. Excellent. Now you know how to deal with your anxiety. And I hung up. Because I didn't need to teach her anymore. Because when you become aware of your body, you find even your emotional states are manifested somewhere on your body. Fear, love, anger. You can actually feel the tightness in your body when you get angry, or you get anxious, or you get afraid. All those have different manifestations. You really get to know them with mindfulness of the body. I mean, not just knowing it's tense, you really get to know them. So you can give it like a one page or two page description to a doctor. Wouldn't that be wonderful as a doctor? If people were so mindful of their body, they would actually give a full detail of what the symptoms are, how long they last, where they manifest, how they evolve. Oh, it would make life as a doctor so much more easy. But then, the solution, being kind to the physical manifestation of the body, and then the anxiety disappeared. And that was seeing that little uh, movement of the hand, the kindness, she got feedback that that caused relaxation, the easing of the symptoms. 
more kindness, more ease, until the physical feelings totally disappeared. And the last part of that story was not that she uh, she was out of bed in a couple of weeks and back to um, back to university. She did graduate with first class honors, and about six months later, I don't mind saying her name, Chippy, and her boyfriend Lloyd, uh, they got married in Perth. And guess who did the blessing for them? <laughs> that was me. <laughs> I was there, Muck. A nice little story with a really happy ending. So you know, she was so happy she had to get me to do that blessing because I'd literally saved her life. And so this was an example of what this mindfulness is and how when you add this wonderful kindness, this letting be, this relaxation, how it can do so much healing. So you start even with your legs and you really relax them, hugely relax. You, you can feel just just being kind to them, your attitude of kindness is sometimes all that's needed. And then it also means you're going to be comfortable when you're meditating. Then you move up to your butt and say, what are you worried about this little area of your buttocks? That's not really important. My goodness it is because many people fidget because they don't sit comfortably. So you need to sort of even care for this, this insignificant, often maligned and ridiculed part of your bo uh, body called your buttocks to make sure they're comfortable. Getting cushions, sitting on a chair, not too soft, not too hard. And once you've relaxed, cared for your butt, then you go up to your back and again, many people have sore backs. Why? You ask any sort of, uh, ask any uh, phys physiotherapist or whatever, and they say because of bad posture. What do you mean bad posture? We're not aware of how we're sitting. And sometimes we sit for too long in an in a unhealthy position and then you're going to get a backache and even ruin your back. So, we just are aware of how did your back feel? And at this time of the meditation, I'm, I'll do this when we do the guided meditation, I just love having a good stretch. You see dogs do this and they just stretch. You can see just, just how happy they feel after they have a good stretch. And you can feel that, just these, I think in the endorphins goes through the body, nature's painkillers, uh, immune, in immune system enhancers, it feels really good. So a good stretch, kind to my body, and then I relax it. And I can actually feel when my body is relaxed. You ask the question, back, are you happy? Do you need to move further back? If you're sitting on a chair, move forward, move to the left, move to the right, how are you back? Because it's amazing, if you ask the question, you get the mindful response. Anything you need to do, move it this way, that way, until it's comfortable. Even the hands, because sometimes people say, your hands have got to be in a special position if you really want to get deep meditation. And of course, that is a lot of BS. Uh, BS doesn't mean the Buddhist society, by the way, it means something different. <laughs> and because you find that you know, your hands can be in any situation, as long as they're comfortable. So you find the most comfortable position for your hand. An experiment, put it here, put it there, because the mindfulness gives you feedback. You find which is the most comfortable position. And once that is done, I usually go to my shoulders, to my neck. So you know, sometimes, it's not so much the cold weather, I'm pretty immune from colds and flus, but I do have hay fever and allergies. It's, uh, genetic uh, inheritance from my father who had asthma. And so every now and again you feel like an itchy throat. And so what do you do with that? You're mindful of it, aware of it, and you learn how to relax it. And it's wonderful being able to do it. I don't, can only really tell personal stories. This is not some supernatural psychic powers, but it's this is what you can very easily do. In my position, when people depend upon me, they're videoing me, or whatever. And I remember just 
the first time I went to Canberra to give a series of talks, it was actually in Tikhwang Bas Monastery when he was he was very young and I was very young and they just, so people decided to, to take me off on a tour around Canberra and, and up to Bandanoon and back again and it was very tiring and you know, the first day in Canberra, you know, you didn't have enough um, heating or clothes on you, so I got a cold then. And by the time I got back to the temple to give my talk, my nose was running, I was coughing and sneezing, I felt terrible. And any sensible person would have just cancelled the talk because of sickness. But, you know, you always, many people just came for the talking, didn't visit Canberra that often. So I thought, okay, I'll give a talk anyway. And it was one of the worst talks. Because you couldn't, you know, even complete a sentence without sneezing. And you just started getting a, some theme going and then had to wipe, you know, this stuff off your nose. And, you know, you felt very terrible. So you can see people, you know, that's why I look at people when I give a talk, because if they're looking at me, then I'm connecting with them. If they're texting or falling asleep or looking at their watch, <laughs> that means that, you know, it's a terrible talk. So they were looking at their watch, <laughs> nodding off. So that's when I said, okay, we're going to stop the talk now. We can do the meditation now for half an hour and I'll continue the talk afterwards. I had half an hour to get my act together. And of course you learn this, being a monk, how to be aware, get to know this cold and this, this irritation in your sinuses, which are getting all this terrible snot coming out of your nose and having to sneeze and feeling really a fever and feeling terrible. Only half an hour. Really get to know it, learn how to relax it, no sort of worry about it, but learn this how to be kind, let things be, to settle things down, not wanting things. Wanting things gives you fear and that makes you more tense. Open it up, relax. After half an hour, I gave this really good talk. And the reason I gave a good talk you know, was the best part of the talk was not uh, the content of the talk. The best part of the talk was that I could give it anyway. <laughs> what he goes up to in the front. <laughs> well, the best part of the talk was the fact that it was um, could happen without a sneeze and no no stuff coming out of your nose. The cold had been stopped in its tracks, and people saw that. Not psychic powers or anything magical. Just understanding how your body works, how to take something and just relax it so much that some sort of healing happens. Because I think most doctors would know that these inflammations are like an exaggeration. The body overreacts, you know, to whatever's happening over there. And then we learn how to relax the body, just part of the body, really relax it. My goodness, it works so well. And if you have to be in the public eye, which I am so often, it's a great way of being able to go on camera at the last moment, like was in Korea some years ago. Sneezed, no, it was, it was minus 26 degrees outside that, no, minus 16, not that much. Minus 16 degrees outside. If you think, if you think that um, Melbourne is cold, this was really cold. And they were doing an interview with me uh, live and I was sneezing. Same thing, give me half an hour and then everything sort of calmed down. You give a nice little interview on TV without a sneeze, without snot coming down from your nose. This is actually what you can do with your mind. You take your body and you can relax it, amazingly so. This is body awareness and kindness, but the incentive to this is actually you can feel just how this can really do wonderful things for your own body. Now, it's an important part of the meditation. Once you've relaxed your body, if it's done properly, your body feels very delightful. It feels happy, it feels good. It's one of the reasons why people go for massages or they go for hot baths. Or they do something sort of, you know, in a spa 
because it makes them physically relax. You do the meditation properly and it does relax you. One of the reasons which I, I emphasize this was when there was a, uh, <coughs> it was a seminar, a conference on meditation over in Sydney some years ago and there was a professor from Stanford University who told us you know, in the conference hall about an experiment which he had done on uh, mindfulness practice in Stanford. His students, he managed to get them uh, to, you know, gave them credits to compare a day of mindfulness against a day in a Californian spa. Stanford University can afford that sort of stuff. <laughs> so he sent half the students to a meditation day like you're doing here and the other half to a Californian spa where they were giving like massages and hot bars and pouring oil over your back. I don't know what you do there. I've only seen it on the, the advertisements but never obviously been there. And all paid for by the university. And when they returned they gave them the standard psychology tests to find out who was the most relaxed. The professor, I've seen him again last year, Philip Goldin, G-O-L-D-I-N from Stanford. And when he, uh, he gave the results, the results were just so conclusive, no doubt at all about it. The people who went to the spa were far more relaxed <laughs> <laughs> than those who went to the meditation day. <laughs> and I thought, what the heck are you teaching them in your meditation? And it's always, I'm be mindful, sit up straight. <laughs> that is not how to meditate. And so if you meditate properly, I'm sure that I could beat the Californian spa. <laughs> You're far more relaxed, otherwise you've missed the point. <laughs> so, what happens is, once you've been through your body and you've relaxed it, you can actually feel it sitting here and it does feel delightful. There's a pleasure of a relaxed body. It's one of the reasons why people go to spas, to get that beautiful feeling of relaxation. Why it is you lay in bed in the morning and you really can't, you don't want to get up for work. It feels really good, the pleasure of relaxation. Or you see people who are just going onto these beaches in Bali and they're leaning back on their recliners, just feeling so relaxed and comfortable, hopefully. Now, in meditation, even at this stage, you have a delight, a happiness. And I don't know what it is that many people feel afraid of happiness. Especially in places like, you get attached, get attached to happiness. So you get attached to so many things with a happiness born of letting go and relaxation that's a good happiness to attach to to really get to know feel because that's very healthy for you because when I was experimenting with this I said let's just let this it feels really good not even gone to the breath yet or anything like that just feeling this body of it so delightfully relaxed oh this feels really good and I found out that as you go stay with the delight of a relaxed body, it takes you deeper into meditation. And as many of you will see, and I'll explain it to you afterwards, even in all the teachings of meditation by the Buddha, in places like the, the gradual training Anapanasati Sutta, they always said just to the delight, the piti sukha, the happiness which comes from meditation, should be aware of, don't try and get rid of it. It's not a mistake, it's what's supposed to happen. So attach to it, indulge in it. It leads to deeper meditation, even with the body. And this is important because those people with sicknesses, just to get that stage of delightful bodily feeling, that gives a lot of healing on your own body. So once the body is really relaxed, indulge in the delight of the body for a while, and then we go to the next stage of the meditation, which is learning how to relax the mind. Now straight away, many people, well, what do you mean, what is this mind? Is it the thoughts? What actually is it? 
So again, to make it even easier for everybody to be mindful of the correct object, that's again, I ask people, I'll ask you when we do this guided meditation soon, how peaceful are you? Or how agitated are you? And give it a number from 1 to 10. People love doing these numbers from 1 to 10. Even just yesterday, just after finishing here, I checked the emails, I have to do that these days. And because I flew from Perth over here to Melbourne on Virgin Airlines, I thought it's the only appropriate airline for a monk to fly on. <laughs> <laughs> But they wanted to do a a customer survey. So I thought, okay, why not? You know. And so they always give a number from one to ten. Your experience at the airport. Give a number from one to ten. Just a food service. Give a number from one to ten. They, they love doing this one to tens. So why not? I can do this as well. So I ask people, well, number from one to ten. How peaceful are you? Or how agitated? Number one means really peaceful. Ten means really dis are so agitated. The only reason you say that is because it makes you aware of something which I've called the peaceometer. Thermometer, speedometer. This is a peaceometer inside of you. So, can you be aware of your peaceometer now? How peaceful are you? Or how agitated? Right now. Now, if any of you are Sutta experts, this is right straight down the line, third Satipatthana, Chitanupasi. Have a look at it. How is my mind? What defilement is there? What defilement is not there? Knowing the state of the mind. How peaceful are you? The most important part. Or how agitated? Now once you can see that, how peaceful or how agitated you are, then when you're looking at that, you can get some feedback. Does it always stay the same? You're always agitated and it just gets uh, the same, or does it get worse, does it get better? And then you, you use your power of exploration, coming from the fact you're getting some mindfulness. What makes me more peaceful? What makes me more agitated? Why do people, I always keep saying, our oh, meditation is difficult. What have you been doing which makes the mind, peaceometer, go up to 10, really agitated? And this is actually where you discover for yourself that the wanting, the controlling, that is what makes you be agitated. Letting it be content. This is good enough for me. Who do I think I am going to get enlightened, you know, today? <laughs> Come on, this is just a bit of peace is enough for me. I don't ask so much in life, I just let it go. And you find attitudes of wanting, of craving, of judging, all of that will make you agitate. You just let things be. Compassion to yourself, opening the door of your heart to yourself as you are. Making peace with this moment. Being kind, being gentle. Experiment. And you find that that makes you really peaceful. Worrying about the future. What time is lunch? <laughs> that just makes you agitated. Worrying about, you know, what happened this morning. That just makes you find that the past and the future, that is what really makes you agitated. So when you learn how just to be here, you're here, just let go, take a break from life. You find, if you really know present moment awareness, you just get very peaceful. That's a sign of being present. Your peaceometer goes really, really close to one. You're really peaceful. Now the reason why I introduce that is because many people do breath meditation, other forms of meditation, but if you go to the breath too soon, you find the only way that you can actually 
uh, be with your breathing is through force. It, you, you, you can't stay with it very easily because you haven't done the groundwork, the preparation. You know, even just giving a talk before we do a guided meditation is already getting you into a state of peace. You come in here from outside, rush to get here. Just even this little talk has got you already quite relaxed and calm. And even the tone of voice. Have you ever noticed this when people give guided meditations? They always lower the tone of your voice and speak. Breathing in, breathing out. You'll find is a special meditation voice which teachers use, which usually send most people to sleep. <laughs> But, <laughs> but that this, you know, don't do it too far. I always tell a few jokes and stories every now and again because that's really important too, so that you can just get some energy and don't go too far into calmness too quickly. So, what we do is learning just how to get the right amount of preparation before you start washing your breathing which often happens naturally. So you're nice and peaceful and calm, and then you can start watching. And it's easy to do, because you're ready for it. You don't need to have any, any force, because it's just the only thing there. And you watch your breath coming in, going out. Nothing else to do in the whole world. Oh, peace at last. Just watching the breath coming in. The breath going out, relaxing as the breath comes in, to the max as the breath goes out. Oh, this is good. Now, one of the important things I hope you've, uh, you've uh, heard is that once you are relaxed, peace is very pleasant. It's not boring. Peace at last, oh joy. Just when you've finished your work and you go home and you put your feet up, have a cup of tea, <sighs> whole long weekend, ah oh, yeah. Or you go on holiday somewhere, you finally arrive and you put your feet up, ah, oh, five days of doing nothing, ah oh, yeah. We don't know how to indulge in the right things. <laughs> So when you get peace, please indulge in it. Because that notices the delight in a peaceful mind. Which means that when the breath comes up, oh, this is so nice. And this is where you go to the teachings of one of those uh, good old friends, the Ajahn Gunha. Some of you met Ajahn Gunha. He's the fellow who pats King Cobras on the head. <laughs> without getting bit <laughs> crazy fuck, he did that. But anyway, when uh, he teaches meditation, you know, we got him to go, go, teach us a meditation. And you know, all, it's teaching the meditation, just five minutes and that's it. And what he teaches is, breathe in, you can actually follow this, so I'm teaching, breathe in, sabha. Ah. Breathe out, Sabha. And Sabha is this Thai word, means nice and easy and calm and joyful. Oh, I can really get into this. Breathing in, Sabha. Breathing out, Sabha. Oh. <laughs> and that's this great Mark's method of meditation. <laughs> he hardly teaches anything else. Breathe in, survive, breathe out. <laughs> but that's actually really sort of on the on the money, as they say in Australia. Because if you do breathe in, make it just joyful. Oh. So that's why sometimes you ask people, you breathe in, breathe in peace. What does peace mean? Like visualize peace, feel peace, paint a picture about peace. What does peace mean for you? 
Now just what it really is, peace. You've had a few moments of peace in your life. Just really get into the peace and you breathe in, you bring in that peace into your body and mind. And breathing out, let go. All the burdens, the worries, the sicknesses, the husbands, the wives, the kids, the bosses, all that breathe out with every out breath. Breathe in peace. Breathe out, mothers in law. <laughs> Breathe in peace. Or whatever it is. I don't know why mothers in law have just got a bad rap in life. <laughs> but you do know that mothers in law, if you rearrange the letters, what does it spell? Mothers in law. Write them down when you go have a break. Rearrange the letters, it re spells Hitler woman. It's an anagram. <laughs> It does. Check it out. <laughs> Poor old mothers in law, they're really good. Anyway, so <laughs> to breathe in peace, breathe out, let go. So you, you make the breath interesting. But it also has to be joyful. If it starts, your peaceometer starts to get noisy, starts to get um, uh, disturbed, then obviously you're doing something wrong, you're trying too hard. So relax some more. And as you go through the meditation, your mindfulness will be able to check whether you're getting more and more peaceful or you're getting more agitated. Now, before we actually do some meditation, problem number one, when people meditate, they fall asleep. What a wonderful thing to do, to sleep. So many people in today's world can't sleep. So you know what happens at one of my meditation retreats? That's such a common question. They said, oh, just when we're meditating in the hall, I fall asleep. But when I go to bed at night, I can't sleep at all. <laughs> and so, you know, when people first ask that, you know, the solution is an obvious one. So when you're meditating here, try to fall asleep. And then you'll be fully awake. And when you go to bed tonight, try to meditate and you'll fall fast. <laughs> now the reason is because when you're meditating here, at least you're letting go. At least you're relaxing. And what your brain needs is a bit of extra sleep time. It's called sleep deficit. Many of you don't sleep enough. Too tense, too stressed, doing too much. So if you do fall asleep, fine. Just have a nice little nap during the meditation. Why do I say that? Because of the teachings of the Buddha, the suttas. There was a time when the Buddha was with his attendant, Ananda. And he saw a monk on the edge of the forest sitting with a straight back, right palm over the left palm, thumbs touching, tin chucked in, meditating, not moving. Perfect posture. And the Buddha turned to his attendant, Ananda, and said, I'm worried about that monk. And soon, a couple of weeks, that monk had disrobed. I knew monks like that. You look to them, perfect posture. But all done by willpower. Stress. Control. You can't last like that very long. But then, deeper in the forest, he saw another monk. Meditating. falling asleep, nodding all over the place. And the Buddha smiled. It's one of those occasions where the Buddha smiled. I'm not worried about him. And a couple of weeks later, he was fully enlightened with psychic powers. So if anyone falls asleep during the next meditation, <laughs> another couple of weeks. <laughs> and the reason is because at least you're letting go. You let go and after a while, when you get your sleep deficit up, you get energized. It's just par for the course. So that's going to be how it works. So, again, I've been doing the first little talk for about an hour. We have, oh, so we can have a 15 minute letting go break.